Hello, welcome to the Maine's Model of School Supports Cohort 2 Tier 1 ATSI Identified Schools in FY22-23. This is a pre-recording done in July of 2024. It is presented by the Continuous School Improvement Coordinator, which is Monique Sullivan. Uh, my name is Monique Sullivan and I am the Continuous School Improvement Coordinator and I work in the ESCA federal programs team, and I work under the Maine's Model School Supports, which falls under several sections of the ESSA statute, but specifically is Title I, Section 1111, and Section 1003. Before we get started, I just want to review the mission and the vision and the strategic priorities for the Department of Education this is the driving force between behind all the work that we do at the Department of Education. Again, to reiterate what the purpose of today's meeting is, this is a pre-recording and it's designed for those schools that were identified as tier one or receiving tier one supports under Maine's model of school supports. They were identified in the FY 22-23 school year and these are uh, a reminder of what the requirements are for tier one identified schools. Today's objectives or this recording's objectives are to understand tier one identification criteria, to identification, to um, have the identification cycles and exit criteria, to understand the different identification statuses uh, between FY22 and 23 and 23 and 24, and understand requirements for tier one ATSI, school improvement plans, next steps for FY24-25, and be able to understand school profiles. In the interest that I know that many schools and SAUs have a lot on their plate, I decided to do a pre-recording and that's what this is. If you have questions, you can send those to me um, to, uh, to my email address, which I will provide at the end of this recording. So to get started, just want to review about identifications. Maine's model school support is run every year, but identifications are made every three years for tier two TSI and tier three tier CSI, and every six years for tier one ATSI. The next identification cycle will be the fall of 2027. Identification cycles are for three years, and eligibility to exit tier one status or convert to another status like tier two or two three will be in the fall of 2027. Before we go on, I just wanna talk about the different types or the identification statuses. Um, Maine's model school support was run and identifications were made in FY22, 23. Uh, these notifications were sent out to SAUs um, in the, in May of 2023, and I can show you how to access those notifications if you don't have them. And tier three, we had schools that were not able to exit. They did receive tier three support in FY22-23, and there were uh, 49 of them, and they were unable to exit uh, per USDO directive. They did meet the exit criteria, but because we, the department was in between um, was trying to calibrate the previous um, uh, May three year assessment with NWA, the US Department of Education said that we were not able to exit. So those schools stayed in tier three status. We also had schools that were re-identified because when the model was run again, um, they, they met the criteria for tier three and they received tier three support in FY22-23 and there were 20 of those. Then we had a set of schools that met the criteria for tier three, but they were did not receive any tier three support because they were outside the 5% uh, per Maine's model of school support plan, and there were 45 of those. And then tier two, there were 86 that were identified. Tier one, there were 77 that were not able to exit it because per USDO directive, we weren't allowed to exit any schools because we were calibrating um, the, um, the assessment. And then in tier one, uh, there were 32 newly identified tier one schools. And then in tier one, there were schools that were re-identified. Um, there were 37 of those. 
Again, notifications are mailed, mailed to SAUs in the May of 2023. I put this in here so that you can understand what's going to what happens this year uh, or happened in 23-24. Before I move on to that, I do want to show uh, schools how they can access their notification letters from 22-23. I've heard from schools saying they have no idea, they don't, they don't remember any of this, they don't receive any of this. So you can access your 22-23 notification letter by going to the FY24 ESA Consolidated Application. Um, you can go to the SAU Document Library, go to General, go to ESA Documents, go to Maine's Model of School Support and Accountability, and there you will have all of the identifications, uh, notifications for schools that were identified for Tier 1, Tier 2, or Tier 3, and FY22-23. I will tell you how you can access um, all of um, I can tell you more about FY 23 and 24 on the next slide. So um, in FY 23, 24, uh, the federal, the US Department of Education um, said that we needed to run the model again, uh, again, because we were in the middle of trying to calibrate um, the NWA, which was given in uh, 21, 22, and then the, um, the uh, May through year assessment, which was administered in 22-23, and they needed to calibrate that. So because of that, we had to run uh, the identif we had to make identifications uh, two years in a row. So in 23-24, um, and those identifications were made in 20 May of 2024, those notifications were sent out to schools um, and SAUs. Uh, there was emails were sent to the school principal, the school the SAU superintendent and the ESCA coordinator for that SAU. So um, coming forward to 23-24, uh, there were out of the tier threes that were able, they were unable to exit um, in 22-23. Now fast forward in 23-24, they were able to exit and we have 13 of those that have exited without support. Uh, there were 23 that were able to exit but converted to tier one because they still continue to have at least one student population that was experiencing challenges across all uh, indicators. Um, tier three, there were um, some schools that had the ability to exit, but they were unable to exit tier three status because they did not meet the exit criteria. And the exit criteria is that you have to have two consecutive years of not meeting the tier three exit criteria. And there were 13 of those. So they were going to continue into tier three status in the FY24-25 school year. And then tier three, there were schools that were not able to exit or not eligible to exit with support. Um, and there were 20 of those. And then there were 27 that were um, that were um, not, not eligible to exit. Um, because they had not uh, served their three years. And these were the schools that were considered newly identified in 22, 23, uh, but they were outside the 5% and that's why they were not receiving um, any support. It is, it is important to know the difference between being able to exit and, and being eligible to exit. Um, the identification cycles are for three years. So if the cycle, the three-year cycle has not been completed, then a school will not be eligible to exit. Once the three-year cycle is complete, then a school will be eligible to exit that status or convert to another status. Um, moving on, number five, tier three, um, there were schools that were identified um, in with supports in FY23. These were new schools that were newly, are newly identified in 23-24, and there are 18 of those and they will continue in that status for three years. Um, tier three, um, these are schools that uh, met the criteria in FY23 for uh, tier three support, but they're outside of the 5% and therefore they're tier three, but not going to be getting any tier three support because they're outside that 5% and there are 29 of those. And then tier two, um, these schools were uh, identified in 22-23, uh, no new uh, tier two schools were identified in 23-24, and these 86 will continue on for another two years to complete the three-year cycle, which then they'll be eligible to either 
exit tier two or convert to another status. Um, tier one, we had um, out of the schools that were tier one in 22, 23, uh, those that were unable to exit in 22, 23, they were able to exit, in, they were eligible to exit this in 20, 23, 24, and there were 35 that actually met the exit criteria and were able to exit. Um, tier, again, on number nine, of those of those schools that were um, identified in 22-23, there were 69 that, although they were eligible to exit, they did not meet the criteria for exit, so they stay in tier one um, until they can exit or convert to another status, and there are 69 of those. And then Tier one, there were schools that were newly identified in 2223. They have not completed their three year cycle. Therefore, they're not eligible to exit yet. And they continue in that tier one status, uh, which there are 55 of those. And then the last one is tier one. They were identified in 2324. This recording uh, really addresses number nine and number 10. These are the tier one schools that either are unable to exit in every 23, 24, or we're not eligible. And that's what this pre-recording is for uh, because you would, did not receive another notification this year. Um, this is kind of like a reminder. You're, you finished up your first, you started, you just finished up your first year of your three-year cycle in 23, 24. And 24, 25, you will continue into your second year of your cycle. And then you'll have a third year in 20 um, and continue, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So you are considered to be cohort two, this group of schools, um, tier one ATSI schools identified in 22, 23. Um, the status is for three years, as I've mentioned already, at least one student population is experiencing challenges or emerging across all indicators, which I will show some examples of that um, further along in this recording. And they will be eligible to exit in the fall of 2026. Um, there are options. You can exit with no support, um, which means no student populations are experiencing challenges emerging across all indicators. Um, you can remain in tier one if a different student population, if different stu student populations, at least one or more are experiencing challenges emerging across indicators. Um, the school could convert to a tier two if the same student populations are experiencing challenges emerging for three years or the school can convert to a tier three um, if all the student populations are experiencing challenges across all indicators. Now, I will talk more about where you can access um, your school profiles for um, FY23-24 um, um, in just a few minutes. So to get to the requirements set forth for tier one ATSI plans, uh, this kind of talks about it. So in the ESSA statute in section 1111, little d to big C, it talks about um, what is required for additional targeted support, which is ATSI, a plan described in some paragraph B, which I'll talk about on the next slide, um, and that um, a plan needs to be created by the local educational agency, and it shall also identify resource inequities, and it needs to address, um, it needs to identify the areas that were, um, that got the school identified, and then to, and all those need to be addressed through the implementation of the plan. And more specifically in section 111 little d to big B, it talks about specifically what the requirements are. You have to have specific stakeholders, um, that are spelled out here, um, principals and other school leaders, teachers and parents, it shall develop the implement a school level targeted support and improvement plan to improve student outcomes based on indicators in the statewide accountability system. Um, and these are indicators that are on the ESSA dashboard, school profile. It needs to be evidence-based. It needs to be approved by the SAU. It needs to be monitored by the SAU. And they assume you must provide support if the plan doesn't work. Now the next slide is kind of just a summary. Um, the, um, the school must develop a plan that is reviewed and approved by the S school and SAU. It has to be in, developed in partnership with stakeholders. It has to be informed by the indicators and main state accountability system, and it includes one or more evidence-based interventions. Now I put an asterisk here because um, 
uh, most schools um, that are Title I, uh, either operate a targeted or school-wide, um, if they operate a Title I school-wide program, they already have a CNA or a school-wide plan. So you don't, schools don't need to create a new plan. They just can use their already school-wide plan and they can just make sure that it includes all the tier one ATSI plan requirements. Now for those schools that operate a targeted Title I program, then um, the SAU is required to create a comprehensive needs assessment, uh, which can be used because technically a CNA, a school-wide, I mean, an SAU CNA is supposed to include all the schools and address the needs um, of those schools in their plan. Um, this plan must include the tier one identified schools and all the tier one um, ATSI plan requirements for those identified schools. Now for those um, tier one schools that are identified that are not uh, title one, now just to take a second, um, uh, the way Maine's model of school support is um, written is that all schools that are title one or title two and are considered to be uh, schools recognized uh, by the uh, Maine Department of Education, um, even if they're not operating a Title I program, they still can be identified for Tier 1 and Tier 2 supports. So if you don't have a CNA, you don't have a, a school-wide plan, and you don't have an SAU CNA, then you can go and use the template which is provided in the Maine Department of Education, um, which is a template for a school-wide plan. You don't need to use that template, but it does outline some of the requirements for a CNA. Um, it is note that all documentation needs to be kept at the school site. Nothing needs to be submitted to the main DOE unless requested. Um, and just wanna let everyone know that school improvement will be included in the FY 2425 ESA monitoring. So if your SAU is monitored, you will be required to submit the tier one ATSI plan as part of monitoring. Um, it is really important uh, because right now there's no way of really uh, sending out information to the tier one principals. Um, so what I'm asking is that um, the SAU needs to add, add the role of LEA tier one principal for all the tier one principals in the address book in the ESA consolidated application for the FY25 ESA consolidated application. If um, if the role is not added, um, tier one school principals will not receive tier one notifications that the grants for me, i.e. this recording. This recording is going to be sent through grants for me. I'm going to tag the LEA tier one principals and the, the superintendent and some other, uh, like the ESA coordinator. Um, so it's really important that this role gets set up in the ESA consolidated application because this is the best way I can get information out to tier one schools. And lastly, just want to review school profiles. Um, uh, they're on the ESSA dashboard. So currently on the ESSA dashboard, um, there's the main model school sports. This has some information that's required, except that's the requirements are set forth in statute. Here you can see um, how schools um, did in Maine's model school support. It does not drill down to the you know, exact um, data or assessment data. You would have to go to Acacia or your NWA school profiles um, there is state assessment, which is another one, which the means model of school support um, is uses that state assessment. But if you want to drill down and find specific, you'll have to access this through your own NWA um, data resources. Now, um, for our school, so this is the public facing site. Now, for our schools this year, we created a separate um, site. Uh, for schools that includes more information uh, about the school profile. Um, it is, um, I when I send out this recording, I will send that link. Um, it, is, um, it is a school, it's a site that was created just for schools and SAUs to look more specifically at their data from a school profile point of view. Um, there's nothing confidential on that information. It's just it gives you a little bit more information at a school level. And I'm breaking that down. So when you get that link and log into it, you'll see that we have um, a lot of information. We have a school profile, we have in count, we have graphs, we have achievement goals, identification over time and a map. So if you're looking at school profiles and you wanna figure out how 
um, the school was identified for tier one supports, um, only one student population needs to render tier one status. And using their the uh, there are using the formula. If you look at this, there are three groups that could have rendered the tier one ATSI status for the school. Um, if you go down to the formula, there's a. I often hear that a school will say, "Oh, we got identified because of our chronic absenteeism." That is partially correct and partially incorrect. Uh, chronic absenteeism cannot um, is not the sole factor that um, uh, renders an identification status. It is the first part of the uh, formula. If um, the student populations are under, are over, or the chronic absenteeism is over 10%, then that is the first part of the equation. So if you go down here to the bottom and it says, has a CSA, has a chronic absenteeism rate of 10% or higher, okay, that meets the and. Then you keep moving forward across the formula and it has to um, be a score of less than 100. And if that's it, then that, if it's a red, then we move to the next piece, which is and. And if that doesn't meet it, and you have a check mark or developing or um, a triangle, then that would not meet that piece of it. Um, and then you would go to the or. So you uh, a school may be okay on the ELA, but then when they go to the math, the math is what uh, rendered the tier one status. Um, the tier one status identification is rendered based on student populations and not on the all students group. So it's really important to go down here and look at the uh, formula and that would render the status. Um, and it looks like, um, again, if you look at this, it's students with disabilities and white students that would have um, rendered the uh, tier one identification status for this particular school. Uh, there's the N count, which gives you an idea of like how many students participated in the May three year assessment. Um, and then the next one is just graphs. It gives you a better, just gives you a visual of what that looks like. And then um, the achievement goals. Um, it is important to know that this is a baseline year. The 23-23 year was a baseline and uh, state averages were used to do the school profile. But on this achievement goals, it's actually set on student on actual school data, which will start moving forward with uh, 2024 um, data. And this is where if a school wants to see the trajectory to see if they will be able to exit uh, tier three stat or tier one status, this is what they want to um, look at. Um, and then the last slide just gives you an idea of identification over time. So um, what was your identification status in 1890, which was the first um, identification that was made under this new um, plan or this amended plan. And then it just kind of walks through uh, where the school is. And the last is just a map of identified schools. And this kind of gives you an idea of where the schools are in the state um, and what their identification status is. And I just wanted to reiterate too, I don't believe I said it earlier, but to be able to exit tier one status, you a school has to have um, three um, no's, which means for three years, they did not meet the identification or the, they did not meet tier one identification or they had three yeses for exits, which means for three years, you cannot have a student population that is experiencing challenges across all indicators. Um, and that is the end of this recording. There are um, resources available. There's professional development calendar. I do also wanna mention that um, all identify per Maine's model school support plan, all identified schools um, can participate in Maine Department of Education's professional learning opportunities at no cost to the SAU and to the school. And no cost means that the Department of Education will pay, Maine Department of Education will pay for registration costs. Um, other costs, um, related to the attending of a professional development opportunity, like travel or salaries paid outside of a con con contract would need to be um, uh, funded with other sources. 
And um, if you need to contact uh, me, my information is here. And, um, and feel free to send me an email if you have any questions. And then lastly, to stay connected with the Maine Department of Education, um, here are other ways to do that. And thank you, and please send any emails or questions that you have um, to me.